This is CUNY TV, the City University of New York. Hello, I'm Doug Musio. This is City Talk. One's a park in the sky, the other would be the park underground. One's the most important addition to New York's public realm in decades, the other could be a successor. One's a great West Side story, the other could be a great East Side story. One's the High Line, the other is the Delancey Underground, or as it's come to be known, the Low Line. Joining us this week are the two fathers of the High Line, Joshua David and Robert Hammond, and we have Dan Barish, the co-founder of the Delancey Underground. Robert Hammond is co-founder of Friends of the High Line, the nonprofit conservancy that manages the High Line. He was awarded a 2010 Rome Prize from the American Academy in Rome. He's a self-taught artist. Joshua David co-founded the Friends of the High Line with Robert, and in 2010, Joshua and Robert received the Rockefeller Foundation's Jane Jacobs Medal for New Ideas and Activism. A longtime Chelsea resident, Joshua is a member of the Advisory Council of Transportation Alternatives. Dan Barish is the co-founder of the Delancey Underground Project, with James Ramsey. He is currently VP at Pop Tech, an NGO focused on promoting socially innovative applications of technology, and this is certainly one of them. Dan has worked previously within New York City government, as well as Google, UNICEF, the 9-11 Survivors Fund, and the World Affairs Council. Very interesting bio. Welcome back, Joshua and Robert. Welcome, Dan. Thanks so much. Last week, we talked about phases one and two of the High Line from, you know, 09 to 11 up to 20th Street and then 20th to 30th. Today we're going to talk about the as yet unbuilt and, and greatly anticipated third phase. But before we actually get into this, let me quote Robert in the uh, epilogue to this very well done book, The High Line, Inside Story of New York City's Park in the Sky. And you write that there were three goals, that it will always be well-loved by New Yorkers. And certainly, the several million people who have visited it so far suggest that. The second, it will inspire others to start their own projects. And three, that it will get better after Josh and I leave. We don't believe that. Let's go to the <laughs> second one, though. In a sense, you're, follow I mean, you're following sort of in their... The awake. Have you guys had conversations with each other? Have you consulted with each other? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, I think it's uh, it's a tremendous honor to be in the same uh, uh, sort of category as these guys. I think uh, what the what Robert and Josh have been able to do is really an inspiration for a lot of people, and uh, I think they're some of the most important social entrepreneurs of uh, of New York City's history. So, it's really oh man, to be that's part really. Of it. I, mean, <laughs> I mean, come on, guys. <laughs> What's been the nature of the he wants more? What's been the nature of the conversation and the advice? In other words, the practical advice of getting this done. What what are the lessons? Well, I mean, as you mentioned, I mean, this uh, book that uh, Robert and Joshua just published is actually, I think, in many cases, a textbook on uh, how to uh, uh, face insurmountable odds and uh, uh, raise tremendous amounts of money, but also to really generate real enthusiasm and inspire a community to do something pretty incredible. Uh, so I think, uh, you know, I've, I was introduced to Robert uh, actually sort of uh, a number of years ago through mutual friends and uh, I actually was talking to him about a separate project that really around uh, bringing art into uh, the underground actually in, in uh, the subway system. And uh, uh, we've sort of stayed in touch and he's been sort of a tremendous uh, a valuable advisor for us and, uh, and Josh has as well. So, What was the most important piece of advice that you learned that you could communicate to folks like uh, James and Dan? Uh, one of my favorite pieces of advice that our, our, our original board chair, Phil Aaron, said is, uh, you know, always give credit to others. <laughs> and that there's an infinite amount of credit to go around, you know, that you don't need to keep it all for yourself and that you can start, you know, giving credit to others right away. Okay, let's let the, go ahead, John. And also to start fundraising. That's right. Immediately. <laughs> money, money, <laughs> money. But in a sense, he, they've got what you had, and that's mom. You had 
or you developed organization, you had a message, and you generated the money. And once you have that, that's a lot of stuff to do. But once you have it, you got it. Let's start with you guys. Let's start with phase three. Now, phase three, it currently ends at 30th Street. And as, you, as you're walking uptown and you come to the end, to the right is this 10th Avenue spur. And then the rest of the High Line goes totally around the Hudson Yards until at 30th Street, it hits grade. What's the difference between this piece, or what are the differences between this piece and the prior two phases? Well, I think I mean most people think the High Line is is finished, so it's one. It's just important to realize that the last third is still to go, and I think it could be the most important, the most exciting part of the High Line, because that's where you have the views of the Hudson River. You have you know all these Joel Sternfeld photographs, the photographs that people fell in love with of the High Line were almost all taken at the rail yards, and and they're still there. Yeah, and it's it looks exactly like that. You're also going to have this incredible development. The Hudson Yards is gonna be 12 million square feet of development. Some people say, oh my God, that's so much development, which it is a lot. But one of the things that makes the Highland exciting is you're going through all these different kinds of neighborhoods and it's never the same in each place. You're gonna get to the Hudson Yards, you're gonna have a completely different kind of neighborhood and I mean, the challenge to the designers is to create a Highline that, 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 that is, uses the same vocabulary that it does in section one and section two, but also responds to this completely different environment that's going to be up there. And the, the other Go thing ahead. that's really important about uh, the development of the third, the third section is that what you're looking at is the two ends of the High Line actually becoming what they're going to be. Up at the northern end, you've got Hudson Yards, 12 million square feet. People have compared it to three Rockefeller centers, um, and it's just a, going it's to be a, a new city within the city, yeah, for right. New York City. Um, and then down at the southern end, you've got the Whitney Museum coming in. Um, so the, the High Line is ultimately going to be the corridor going between the Whitney Museum and Hudson Yards and passing through the village in West Chelsea along the way and all these amazing um, amazing galleries and businesses and residences. And I think the, the development of those two ends is going to be the thing that really makes the High Line ultimately fulfill its promise on the west side. Ooh. What, what, what seems interesting about this third phase is that the first two phases, there was not one developer. There was not one landowner. There was not one architect. You've got world, several world-famous architects, all kinds of buildings that pre-existed. Does the fact that you've got one developer and probably one architect, even though they're using the same folks that you use, how does that change the... the the mental mindset of, of the play, the physical place. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that gives us an opportunity to work with them. So the related companies is the company that's going to be developing sure. all of that. So we're going to be working very closely with them to make sure it works and make sure the connections make sense. And when and, you say yeah. we... So, you know, we, want, we we're using the same design team of James Corner Field Operations with Dillard Scafidio and Renfro and Pete Oldoff, but also involving the community. Just last week, we had our first, you know, community input session. Before the designers start designing, we wanted them to hear from the community, you know, what they like and what they don't like about the part that's open, and what do they want to see in this last mm -hmm. section. This is, you know, this is it. If you don't get it in here, right. you're not going to get it right. in. And so, you know, people... And, you know, and, and then we're going to go back to them probably um, in January or February of 2012, you know, as the designers start coming up with ideas to see what the community thinks of them. When are we going to start working on this? <laughs> I mean, Come we, on. We, we, you know, I mean, I think we'd be, be very, yeah, I, well, should we? No, <laughs> should don't be, no, that's why you're so, so successful. Don't be reasonable. Okay, so if we're going to be unreasonable, we'd love to start construction next year. And the earliest I think it could ever probably be open is 2013 or 2014. Wow. Yeah. Now, one of the, th the th features that, that struck me was this 10th this Avenue spur. That looks to me like the widest part of the whole development. Will that be a different kind of space? That's almost a space that demands to be used in, a, in an active way. Yeah, we're looking at different ways that that site can be can be used right now, but it's a really amazing part of wow. the High Line. It was what was what was built originally to carry trains into the Morgan Postal Building at the corner of 10th right. Avenue and 30th Street, so that was its sole purpose. And it goes along, it is really wide, and then it crosses 10th Avenue, and you get this amazing view from, from there, both out to the Hudson River, over 
over 30th Street, but also down 10th Avenue to the other 10th Avenue viewing viewing area. So there are incredible opportunities on that site. People in the community, you know, one of the things that came up over and over at this input session was, you know, performance or music, maybe being able to do something like that sure. on that space. Is sure, sure, because it's a big it's a big venue yeah. given the, the relative size of the rest of it. Okay, yep. let's now we're going underground <laughs> and we look at the current what it, it's a mess. Tell me. <laughs> Tell me the generation of this idea and where you are, because you've begun following some of the steps that these guys had to go through to get their dream, you know, actualized. Go ahead. Absolutely. So uh, much of the credit in terms of the generation of the idea goes to my partner who's, who's not here. James Ramsey is an architect and a designer. He's working on a technology that really brings sunlight underground using fiber optics. Okay. Uh, this technology, which is pretty exciting, we can talk about it. Yeah, uh, please, and, do. Uh, uh, separately, as an architect, he was talking with a range of people uh, at the MTA, some former MTA officials, about the acres and acres of land underground. Now, that how did is he unused. know about it? Uh, it was a former MTA official who sort oh, of okay. had known uh, you know, uh, all the secrets, the ins and outs of the MTA. And uh, so, you know, it turns out there's this massive, massive space. It's one and a half acres in size, 60,000 square feet, uh, just at the base of the Williamsburg Bridge underneath Delancey Street. And um, as an architect and as a designer, James got extremely excited about the potential of marrying the technology, the solar technology, with this particular space. And uh, James knew that I have sort of a background in uh, uh, city politics and uh, working on uh, sort of thinking about how technology can be put to social good. So he. Uh, asked me if we should work together on it, and we had you ever worked together it. before? We are very close friends. But, okay. Uh, yeah. Now talk about this 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 technology that <clears throat> gathers light and then filters it down. The artist renderings. I mean, I want to go to this place. Yeah. It, it's 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 real science fictionist. I, I I looked at it and I said, oh my, this is a post apocalyptic <laughs> movie, or this is you know Logan's Run. What is this? <laughs> talk about talk a little bit about the science and the practicality of the science and how the that will generate the <clears throat> the enthusiasm to build this space. Sure, absolutely. So. Uh, it's, it's both science fiction and it's not. In, in many respects, there exists a, a, a whole industry called daylighting, which is really the, uh, uh, the business of, of bringing sunlight into interior spaces. And so the easiest way to daylight a space is to uh, simply design so that uh, you can draw sunlight into the space during the day. Uh, uh, the next sort of step up is, a, is an actual skylight. And then there exist uh, some sort of third generation technologies that really bring sunlight un underground. Uh, either via tubes or via fiber optics. And this is a new industry, and uh, you know people have uh, uh, built up some commercial outfits out there. So it's not as crazy as it sounds. Uh, I think the, uh, the central innovation that we have here is that uh, we're sort of designing um, uh, the space, really uh, thinking about it from an aesthetic standpoint, and also thinking about uh, really the sort of um, uh, uh, building it with maximum efficiency above ground so that you can in, a, in an environment like New York City that doesn't have a lot of access to the sun, a lot of uh, capacity to sort of put up these massive arrays, that you can have an extremely efficient collector and draw the sunlight underground in a really efficient way. Where do you put the collectors? On the median at Delancey Street, or do you put it on the bridge? Yeah, so there's a lot of, a, 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 a key consideration here is actually what's happening above ground. So there is a very large uh, economic revitalization program in this neighborhood called Spura, Seward Park, uh, urban renewal area. And uh, so uh, a lot of the sort of considerations around where the arrays will go will very much depend upon how that goes. Uh, I think in, in theory, we can uh, array these uh, solar collectors on top of buildings or uh, on the median, as you see. And it can be transmitted. So we have all these catch things and then it sends. <laughs> I mean, this is, this is, OK. Let's move away a little bit from the science. And the bottom line is the MTA's got this space. The MTA is, is broke. They need to make money. You guys needed to make money, but you didn't need to make money in a profit sense. But you had to raise a lot of money. This is a little bit different because the MTA has to make money. How do you convince them that this is a money maker? Sure. So we've had a lot of conversations with the MTA, the real estate division, and uh, even up to the former chairman, uh, who tellingly actually is now, now in Asia. Um, but the, uh, uh, one of, the, one of the, the, the things that I think we actually do share in common with the High Line is uh, in uh, the earliest stages of the High Line, some of the um, uh, argument was really from a real estate perspective and saying that th the neighborhood could actually have been 
um, uh, monetized in a different kind of way. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the incredible things that, uh, that Robert and Josh were able to do was to build the case that actually economic value can be generated uh, from a public space, from, mm -hmm. a, from, a, from a, a community park. So this is one of the things that we're spending a lot of our energy on now, actually, is working with local business leaders, uh, all of the political stakeholders, and the MTA, really, on uh, building the case for, for what this could do for the Lower East Side economically uh, and for the city. Uh, there's also sort of an, an, another conversation to be had around the actual use of this technology, uh, which is to say that um, the technology itself um, means that uh, once this is built, one will not need electricity underground during the day. So the, as a passive daylighting technology, you are able to actually power um, uh, the space. I mean, uh, aside from all of the, all of the incredible aesthetic elements mm -hmm. that the space will be, um, uh, it, it will be saving electricity and it will be, I think, a symbol for uh, the ways in which new green technology should be uh, deployed in an urban setting. You would think, though, that the, the, the national government would be interested. You guys got to be applying to the Obama administration for green funding, no? Yeah, we're engaging with all potential funders and, uh, and all sorts of stakeholders at the federal level, uh, state, and city. What, what, what would be the aesthetic? Why would I go into this place other than the <laughs> fact that it is this space that you've got all this natural light and, just, you know, <coughs> dozens of feet below ground. What, what is it going to be down there that would draw me in other than simply the uniqueness of the place? Yeah, you know, that was one of the first questions that came to us when we presented to the community board, actually, only two months ago. Uh, and so uh, one of the fun ways I, that, to sort of think about that is just how sort of generations of New Yorkers have really been trained to think about the underground as necessarily not a nice place to spend time, right? Uh, it's obviously a place where there's rats and it's where you get mugged or uh, at, at, at a minimum there's uh, something dripping on you. Uh, but actually, uh, the space actually could uh, uh, be built in an incredibly beautiful and aesthetic way. So uh, one of the core um, ideas that we have here is really around using the, uh, the remote skylight technology to enable plants and trees and grasses so that you could actually have an experience that would be um, not like the High Line, but a different kind of park, a uh, sort of underground subterranean space where there would be plants and trees. Um, and, uh, and you would have really the opportunity to create a space that would be you know, a, a public gathering space. Um, I mean, the city is full, actually, of environments underground that are actually quite nice to spend time. And also, uh, it bears noting, uh, it's quite nice to um, uh, go shopping in uh, a lot of these kinds of spaces. So. One example that I think is really fun is, you know, the Apple Store right near Central Park right. on Fifth Avenue. So, you know, underground in that space there, you know, through the innovative use, by the way, of daylighting technology, right? Sort of they, they, they build this glass cube and it draws sunlight underground. Um, you know, people don't, in that, in that space, think about are there rats? Is it safe? Uh, uh, you know, am I going to want to spend time down there? Because it was designed really beautifully. And I think... Uh, with these kinds of considerations and with um, a, a really um, sort of high-minded sort of design objective, I think you can create a space that would be really, really fun to spend time. Where do you guys go? You've got phase three of your project. Is, is there another project out there? Are, are there other spaces out there, whether they're above ground, below ground, in the water, wherever, where you could have this kind of you know, aha insights that you had or, or that you well, and James I mean, had. people are doing it all over the city. And, you know, the city and all over the country, all over the world. You know, there's right across the water in Jersey City Embankment. Um, they're doing Chicago. one in Queens. Chicago. But, you know, even yeah. right here, there's, yeah. they're just starting one up in Queens right. that's getting going. Um, so I think these are happening all over. Right now, we're focused on, <laughs> right, you know, right, we, we still got, got a big job right, of finishing right. the high line. So you don't so, want to go thinking beyond So that, that's, that's, that's right. where we're, what we're focused on. And, but you've gone, you've gone to the community boards. What's been the response of the community boards? And altogether, are they sort of similar types of concerns that were articulated with, with you guys and with you? What are the concerns? Well, you know, uh, it's, it's interesting, actually. Um, uh, when we uh, present the idea to the community or to sort of a lot of different kinds of people, uh, the first thing people say is, it's, oh, it's sort of like a low line. And actually, that's sort of been the nickname right. for this concept. Mm -hmm. What we've heard actually a lot is uh, a lot of enthusiasm um, around the idea. And I think, again, this is something that we, we really owe to the, to the high line and the fact that people can imagine that sort of a space that doesn't seem that inviting could be transformed uh, into something uh, magical. Uh, I think from a business perspective, there's this narrative in the Lower East Side. The Lower East Side is obviously very different from, sure. from the West Side. Sure, sure. 
And uh, one of the lessons that I've actually drawn from, uh, from the Highline experiences is really the importance of focusing on the community um, and, and really sort of building up community support at all levels and at all stages. And so one of the things that I think we've really heard a lot from the community is uh, uh, this is a neighborhood that, uh, and specifically this site near Delancey Street, is in many cases sort of a victim of uh, Robert Moses' era neglect and uh, the destruction of tenement buildings. Uh, the history of the Lower East Side is an extremely interesting one to me personally, and this is one of the reasons why I'm uh, so excited by the project. Um, but there's this narrative of, of the Lower East Side as, as really not being a neighborhood that has um, uh, you know, uh, been able to develop. Uh, there is uh, a sort of a very large uh, proportion of Lower East Side that is on uh, sort of public assistance. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and yet, it's this incredible community of artists and musicians and uh, uh, restaurants and, and art. And so uh, I think a lot of the business owners, a lot of the people who, who speak for and are of the community are tremendously excited about the possibility of something that they could be really proud, about, mm -hmm. proud of, but also could serve as a magnet for the neighborhood mm -hmm. and, and hopefully serve as an economic engine. I've, go ahead, Josh. And I think that's a, a really important part of the project. One of the things that we're, we're experiencing now is a very high level of destination visishipship tourists who are coming mm -hmm. specifically to the High Line mm -hmm. to see the High Line. It's one of their things that they're doing. I heard doing 50 in New different York. languages yeah. on we're, Sunday. We're getting the same visitorship as the Empire State Building right now. Um, and I think one of the things that's really special about projects like the High Line and like potentially Delancey Underground is this is something unique to New York. When you know this is these are the kinds of projects that make New York City a compelling city and ultimately are, are what will carry us into the future. Things that nobody else is doing, nobody else has, things that are really sort of leading the way, and that's why I think this is a really... One of the things that's item. been said about the, the High Line in the sense is that you build it and they will come, but in fact it's the opposite. They were there, in a sense, the buildings, the architecture, mm. the surrounding structure, and you built within it. Is that the same, is that the same thing with you? Is there the, the external environment, as you just discussed, that sort of draws you in down, downstairs? So it bears noting this space hasn't been touched since 1948. It has uh, six decades of, uh, of uh, neglect inside there. But what it also it's has... It's an archaeological and biological find. I'm it's sure incredible. You know. It's incredible. Yeah. It's actually it has a great patina. Mm -hmm. One of the one of the one of the incredible things about about the space is actually that fact. You know, I mean, I think uh, every inch and every square foot in New York City is always sort of uh, thought about. Sort of, how can you turn it into a profit? How can it be used, um, turned over? And for it, really through an accident of history, uh, uh, you know, the MTA and the city hasn't really had any use for the space over the course of the last six decades. And so here we are, we have this space that has, uh, it's, it was a former trolley terminal, so it was, it was where the, the, the trolleys would sort of go over right, the lanes for a bridge. Right, and, and, and turn around. And turn around and sort of serve as a depot for, uh, that was the, and, and again, this, this predates the sort of use of cars in the city. It's just a really exciting uh, thing. And uh, underground, you can see actual remnant cobblestone. You can see the rail line. And that will be retained similarly to the way these folks and their architects retained it on the High Line? I mean, we would hope to, yeah. I mean, I think I was actually up on the High Line this last weekend as well. Oh. And uh, yeah, we That's all were. We all right. Were. <laughs> <laughs> How many millions of people were up there? Yeah, no, literally <laughs> thousands on Sunday. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I mean, I think it's, an, it's incredibly inspiring for the kind of people who think that um, sort of remnant infrastructure is exciting to, to, to dream what it could become, uh, to sort of blend the new and the old and to really <clears throat> pay homage to what the space actually was. Uh, that's something that's really inspiring us is thinking about how we take from a design perspective the, uh, the actual sort of remnant uh, infrastructure and architecture to really make it new and really sort of bring it uh, from a technology standpoint mm -hmm. to, to a place that, that really challenges assumptions. One of the advantages that you guys had, and I, I guess it was in one of the pieces that I read, that you had built a, a coalition of tastemakers, <coughs> that there were people who had celebrity and, and influence and money, et cetera, in a sense, to back it. Do you have the same? I mean, just, just doesn't, I mean, you, you had the galleries and you had the Diane von Frustenberg. What, what, do, you, what do you got? <laughs> Well, okay, so one of the g amazing things about uh, some of the attention that we've generated, I mean, one of the things to remember is I think we're, we're, we're about two months into this uh, in terms of the public knowing that it exists. And, it, and it's generated a lot of buzz, a lot, a lot of buzz. It's been pretty exciting to see how people have reacted to it. I think part of it is everyone is looking for what is the next highline. Right. Um, uh, or one of many next highlines. But uh, uh, the sort of, you know, separately, I think people are genuinely really excited about this. And so one of the things that has happened is people have come out of the woodwork to talk to us about how they might potentially work with us. 
uh, uh, sort of folks in um, in in, uh, in schools want us to teach classes to uh, to their students, and um, sort of cultural institutions have asked us if we would um, you know want to work with them in, in a variety of ways. So one of the things that we're doing, I mean, uh, sort of where we are right now is really thinking about how we build up an organization. And again, we have a textbook from which to work, uh, uh, and we're sort of thinking about how we sort of do this in a way that makes sense on the Lower East Side. Where is the MTA on all this? I mean, they're the key actor. What I mean, what are the possible futures of this? Thing? Indeed. So you know, I mean, obviously, our our um, our uh, our goal in 2012 is to submit the winning bid to the MTA for uh, uh, what this space will become. As you mentioned, the MTA uh, is is out of money and uh, is looking actively to RFP. Uh, uh, most of its existing infrastructure mm. that, that you know that, that it can. Sure. So it's already released. I think uh, RFPs for about a, a dozen spaces, and uh, we know that uh, this space, the Delancey Underground, will be uh, up for for bidding next year. And you will bid. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. And and how so sort of how we're thinking about doing this is is really working on a number of fronts. First of all, we want to create a sense of inevitability from a community perspective mm -hmm. that this is something that the community has has already and will hopefully with, with, with really working with the community um, uh, really sort of articulate the interest and, in, in fact, you know, some level of demand for community space in a uh, part of the city that has very limited green yep. space. Yep. Um, uh, and uh, so sort of the sense of inevitability, a sense of community, a sense that this is something that the community really sort of wants. Uh, but we also, I think, need to make a, sort of a, a proper sort of economic case. And I know, um, you know, one of the things um, uh, that's really just been incredible is sort of actually measuring the economic impact of the High Line. Right. Uh, we can sort of uh, point to the High Line only so long. We actually also need to be able to demonstrate very specifically yep. how this will yep. impact this particular neighborhood. And, you know, I think we have a lot of incredible ideas on how we'll do that. Uh, and I think sort of really at the end of the day, we think that we can partner with the MTA uh, uh, to deliver something that, that will serve their goals as well as something that will be positive wow. for the community. Boy, thanks to you <laughs> for the High Line. And I am, in 2015, I want to walk in this space. <laughs> I want to Please. have, I want to have coffee, I want to, and, and I just want to see this, this, this light coming from the ceiling that really comes from the, the streets above. Thanks to Joshua David, Robert Hammond, and Dan Barish for joining us today. See you next week on CUNY TV. Hello, I'm Doug Musio. Let us know what you think about this show. You can reach us at cuny.tv. When you get there, click on the bar that says contact us and send your email, whatever it is. Thanks, no thanks, obnoxious, do it, send it.